So I'm Jeff Hankinson and welcome, uh, welcome once again to my shop and today I'm going to do a presentation on uh, drying wood with a vacuum kiln. That may seem a little science fiction-y for a lot of people but actually this technology is a hundred years old at least because physics has known about vacuums and what's happened uh, in those for a, a very long time. And actually all the mathematics and physics were sorted out back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, not not that long ago, so this is old news in the science world. But it's a it's a rare victory for the little guy because of their nature and because of the way uh, commercial wood is dried. It really is not worth their while to build vacuum kilns. Woodmiser actually made one and was marketing it through the 90s, I believe, maybe even the early 2000s, and they don't make it anymore just because it's too much hassle to load in a big pile of wood and try to get a vacuum seal and dry it that way. But for the little guy, this is a victory. So uh, I learned about this after researching all kinds of ways of drying wood. We all know air drying a year per inch of thickness plus a year. And I, I for one, no, I'm not waiting that long. And I don't know about Bert, but he probably didn't wait that long either. No. Uh, you can buy commercially dried, kiln dried wood and that costs you an arm or leg. I like to use our native woods here in Alberta, birch and uh, poplar and Manitoba maple and they're all very amenable to this. Any, any wood will do with this, although I haven't tried ebony. That's out of my price range. So um, I researched uh, this and I researched a small worm box drying, almost built one. That's building a box the size of a, a little cupboard and putting about a 60 watt light bulb in there. And that would work very well. Uh, it takes about six months. Uh, and while in the course of my research, I came across this book by a fellow called Joshua Salison, who is a uh, ornamental turner in California. And I found this book on Amazon.com, the fourth edition now. I, I got the third edition. And I was in a lot of correspondence with him and uh, subsequently set about building one. Now, uh, I'll, what I'll do is uh, briefly describe the process and then I'll show you the kiln and how easy it is to build. It's, it's unbelievable. It's so easy. And uh, first I'll talk about how quickly it works. So a year, a year per inch of thickness plus a year. So this piece of wood is a couple inches across. This should take three years. And this is a piece I did for a demo for our club. Uh, in December of 2015, I went out with a friend of mine and we chopped down about an 18 inch black poplar, balsam poplar, in the winter, frozen. We sliced it up on his wood miser. And I had uh, a whole bunch of wood from that, still have it. And this is one of those pieces. I had a, a longer one. This was about uh, six feet long. So I cut three pieces like this. And they're about 16 inches by 18 inches. One I kept out. Two I put in the kiln on January 1st, 2016. I had nothing else to do that day. So I put it in the vacuum kiln January 1st, 2016 at way over 55% moisture. It, it was mm. wet and frozen. So I took it out of the kiln three days later at zero percent. Three days. And I turned this platter out of that same stuff, one of those pieces, on January 6th, 2016. So, and this is, this is heartwood, you can see. Should have cracked. Should this is the worst kind of wood to dry? It's perfect. That is, that's amazing. So it's it's like magic. It's unbelievable until you until you've done it. And uh, I've done enough now that typically it'll take me three days to dry wet wood. If I'm in a hurry, it's dry. If you get wood that's sealed with wax, it's wet, guaranteed. Can you grab me one of those hunks of wood over there, Bert? Anyone? Yep. So all of us know that wood is like a bundle of straws. 
literally. And the research I've read uh, suggests that something like 95% of the drying comes out the end of the straws. It doesn't come out the side, it comes out the end. And that's why I think it cracks. If you've got a piece of wood that's, you know, 50% moisture here and 10% moisture here, there's a huge amount of stress in the wood, just over a very small area. You're going to get a crack. But it's, um, it's so much faster and so much gentler to the wood to do it in a vacuum kiln that you get very minimal cracking and checking, unbelievably. The wood doesn't have to be much beyond body temperature. Heat is the enemy of wood, and that's where you get lots of cracking. You leave wood out in the sun, <laughs> you're going to see some cracking. Mm -hmm. So I'm convinced it's very simple to implement. Uh, Joshua Salison's book uh, talks about it in depth. The fourth edition has got some corrections to the science, and uh, there's not a lot of science. It's just so you understand what's going on. So what happens is at sea level, water boils at 100 degrees centigrade. But here in central Alberta, I'm at about 2,600 feet. And water boils at less than that. I think 98 something, 99, something like that. So if you keep going up, water boils at a lower and lower temperature. So a vacuum kiln takes you way up above the atmosphere. So water will boil here at about 36 degrees centigrade. So to heat the pieces I have in here, I use a simple technology. You want to grab that for uh, According to Josh's book, and that's these heat mats. You could use your, you could, these are rubber. You plug them in, 110, and they go to about maybe 40 degrees centigrade, and that's it. And that transfers some heat into the wood. There's no point in putting uh, a lot of other heat sources in there because there's no air. So you put a little bit of heat in, you take out the air pressure that keeps the water in the wood, and the magic happens. So it's a combination of evaporation and vaporization. And the vaporization wave of the wood spreads from the outside gradually to the inside as the wood heats up. And I know when I'm done, when my, when my uh, moisture readings get all screwed up. You can see them go down, 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 and then they start jumping around. It's done. And you just need it somewhere around 10, 6, 6 to 10 percent, and it's fine. It's stable. But uh, um, I'll take it down 10, 12. A lot of times... It goes down to zero because I go to bed and forget about it on the last night. I don't fuss about it anymore. When I wake it up, I'll, I'll If it goes it down to zero, then that would be uh, excellent for people that want to do some wood stabilization because it would take the moisture content. They like to get for stabilizing, get the moisture content as low as possible before they put the resin in. Yeah. So it, it, it might be an option for people yep. that do uh, stabilization. And, and I don't think it's zero from end to end. Right. I think it's when I get it dried, it's zero... And I've cut Where wood apart is. doing yeah. this at zero at the end. And then there's a gradient that goes up to maybe, I've found about 12% in the middle and then down. So that's fine. If I dry it to zero in here, it's done. So uh, that's how it works. You put some wood in there, you warm it up just a little, you apply the vacuum, and you make sure the vacuum stays for uh, about three days. And I automate this. I don't have the pump running continuously. I have it run for about 20 minutes every hour just for losses and things. And, and it works. It's amazing. So out of those two pieces of wood that I showed you that I put in this thing, I got three gallons of water. Wow. Couldn't believe it. So they were more than 50% water. There was, <laughs> there was a lot of water, 12 liters. So um, what is this made of? You can make them out of a piece of one inch diameter sewer pipe, the real heavy stuff you see around construction sites. And I think the best way to do that is um, have a chunk of pipe that's maybe three feet long and a couple of probably three sixteenths inch steel plates to put on the end. Now mine is a uh, 18 inch diameter steel pipe about um, three eighths 
wall thickness. On the far end and on this end, I have quarter inch steel plates. And on the far end, because the fewer leaks the better, on the far end I welded it on. So the only place I have to look for leaks is at this end and any holes I've drilled in it. My gasket is cheap like anything. This is a uh, 18 inch bicycle inner tube. And I cut it around the circumference and snipped out the valve, of course, and stretched it over, over the end like a sock. It's all I need. Works. It's cheap. I even have a spare. I've had a spare for five years. <laughs> I haven't blown a flat yet. And uh, so how do you get the vacuum? I use a uh, Welsh um, um, vacuum pump. These are used in labs. They're a piston pump and they are bulletproof. I got mine secondhand off of eBay. Uh, Josh Salison talks about exactly what kind to use in his book. I have used uh, a small one that I got for 80 bucks off of Amazon and it's a little oil diaphragm pump and it works. It'll pull the right vacuum but there is so much water comes out of these things that the, the air coming out of them as you continue to pull a vacuum is just laden with moisture, very, very high humidity. So you're bound to get water in the vacuum pump. If you put your $500 gas pump that you use for your vacuum chuck to work, you will destroy it, in my opinion. And the other cheaper ones, like I've got one from another place that's, that's similar to a gas, and I, I don't even go anywhere near that. So the, the, the Welsh uh, vacuum pump, like Joel describes, that works. And it's, the airflow is nothing. It's like 0.9 cubic feet per minute. Mm -hmm. But it just keeps chugging away, and it'll pull it down. How much vacuum do you need? You need about more than 26 inches of mercury. So I can pull 27.3, and I, I calculated that that should be the maximum for this altitude. Uh, as mm -hmm. far as I know, I'm not great with physics. But more than 26 and more than uh, 36 degrees centigrade in there, the water will boil. And I checked that by putting in a camera and a heat plate and a pot with water in it and a thermometer and stuff like that. And I could see. Because <laughs> I wanted, I didn't know. Who could I ask? Yeah. There wasn't anybody to ask. Uh, as far as, so that's the, the back and the front, the gasket. I've got one half inch uh, pipe nipple that was about uh, eight inches long, cut it in half, drilled a hole for it in the top and welded it on. And then I've got some standard half inch uh, uh, pipe fittings on there. I've got a uh, vacuum gauge here, just a little one. And that one goes to uh, uh, negative 30. Uh, inches of mercury and uh, out the bottom I've got the the other half of the pipe nipple with a valve on it. These valves I got at my local hardware store they're gas rated valves and they work very well they were like eight bucks. So the pipe in Alberta you can get pipe cheap. It's all over the place. The steel quarter inch steel this dents in <laughs> under the pressure probably a sixteenth of an inch on the back here I measured it so you need quarter inch for sure. I don't think you can overbuild these. This is all standard stuff I got at my hardware store. Uh, the vacuum line is a uh, 3 8 braided plastic line and that goes to the pump down there. Now I've got some other things in there. I built a little tank underneath, you can't see it, that uh, is 4 inch pipe with a pipe nipple coming in and out of it. And, uh, uh, and valves top and bottom. Because as the water's coming out of the wood, uh, it condenses on the walls of this. You, uh, Josh uh, Salison talks about keeping his warm. I don't keep my warm, I want it cold. I want the water to condense on the outside of the, the pipe, run down, and then go out the bottom uh, through that half inch uh, pipe and into this little chamber that I built. It's four inch pipe like this with pipe uh, welded on top and bottom and then pipe nipples coming in and out with valves. So if I can drain the water from here into that tank, close off this tank, 
open that one and drain it, that water's gone. It's out of the equation. So I don't have to worry about it. And uh, that's, that's about it. I ran 110 in here. So I use the uh, commercially prepared wire and I'll drill a very tight fitting hole here, run the, run the wires out this way. So I've got 110 and I have a USB extension cable and I've got my temperature cable and a few other things in here, my temperature sensor cable. And uh, so I drill a tight fitting hole and I seal that with good old seal all that you can find in any hardware store. Works like a charm. Tried silicone, doesn't work. Silicone peels off this thing. Uh, the only other thing I have is a temperature gauge and uh, that's a specific kind I found. Um, is it Bert, there's a little box over there that's sort of orangish and that's on the right hand side and uh, that one is just a little black wire comes out of it and I put that into the end of the wood and you can't quite see it. You'll see it on the wood video but I just drill a quarter inch hole, stuff the little sensor in there and uh, the little sensor, this little thing, just looks like this. Not anything special. This is a STC-1000. These are cheap on Amazon. And the little sensor wire runs, runs down. The little sensor in the end looks like that. Just a little ball, little rubber ball. It's all rubberized. It's perfect. I tried putting in a, a relative humidity sensor in there and uh, I, I had an idea it wouldn't work because it doesn't make sense because of uh, physics and stuff, but I wondered if I could get some kind of information out of it, but you can't, so don't bother. Those SDC 1000s are just fine. So what I will do is load my wood in there. Uh, I want it up off the bottom, so I just built a simple plywood uh, shelf and it's supported here. I wanted it somewhere just below center, so I got the widest width here. And I can put uh, whatever I want. If I got a bunch of, I don't, I don't put in already turned pieces. Uh, I like putting in uh, just uh, blanks of wood, not a really prepared bowl blank, for example, because you're gonna get a little bit of checking and stuff, and if you want that size, you're gonna lose some of the wood, and you'll be disappointed. So I put in stuff that's bigger, that dries just as fast. The limiting factor is just getting enough heat to rise through the wood. Once it gets to the center and everything's vaporized, it's done. And it doesn't take that long. So I will load pieces in there on top of one of these rubber mats. And this rubber mat's uh, getting warm. We plugged it in a while ago. It takes a while to warm all up, like there's no rush with these things. And I'll often put a second mat on top of things that are like this, just so I got warming top and bottom. Then I close it up. I'll close it up with this thing. I'll put out, I have four ordinary pipe clamps that go on here. Two in the bottom, two in the top. And these are just to get it started. I won't, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start it up while I'm talking. Sure. Um, so these are just to get it started. Once it's running, there's something like 10,000 pounds pressure on the outside of this tank. That's why you don't use something that's not very strong, because it won't explode, it'll implode. And that'll be very disappointing. <laughs> And I don't do these up very tight. I've got my, uh, I've got my bicycle inner tube in there. They just have to be tight enough. And once this thing's going and pulling a vacuum, I, I could take them off. I, I ignore them, but I could take them off. Now, 25 degrees in there right now. Yeah, 25 degrees. Yeah, that's great. And that's mostly from outside. But it'll warm up now that uh, this is on. So I make sure that my valves are open. I've got an exhaust valve to atmosphere so I can let the air in when I'm all done. That actually goes through an experiment to try to get some of the moisture out of the line, but I've disconnected it for this demonstration. I think my gasket on that is leaking. And then I turn it on. And that's as noisy as this pump is. 
So it'll run for a while. It takes it about, uh, oh, probably 30, 40 minutes to pull 26 inches of, of mercury vacuum. And as the temperature is rising, then it just slowly warms up the wood and things start happening. And as I said, I automate this just with a mechanical timer I got from the hardware store. So I'll plug in the uh, vacuum. And I actually have an inline valve on my usual setup here that runs on 110 that I got from Princess. And that opens under power. So when the motor comes on, that valve comes on. And uh, I've just got a better seal for the tank. And, and it only has to run for 20 minutes maybe every hour or so over three days. So it's not a huge power draw, it's not a big deal, it's re really not complicated as you see. I built this up on a stand because I didn't think I needed to bend over to be doing this stuff. And I put wheels on it so I can wheel it around my shop. A 2x4 just gives me the right spacing for this thing to go up to the gasket and that's it. I make sure the vacuum is started. If you've got a leak somewhere, you'll hear it pretty quick. Let's start to pull the vacuum bird. Yeah, and it doesn't take very long. And it's no more complicated than that. So, you know, three days, I, I don't think I've gone any longer than three days ever. If I've got wood that's already partly dry, then, uh, um, you know, it's going to take less than that, maybe two days. And if I'm not sure, I'll throw it in there and leave it run for a day or two and then pull it out and turn it or something. Because it, I don't like turning wet wood. I like to get... Uh, I, I like to get what I turn. I don't. I don't like it moving on me. They, they move anyway, and it's not because of moisture. That's more because of stresses in the wood, as you know. So you might want to talk a bit about what we're seeing here, because I see something happening here now. So talk about what we set up. Okay. Okay. So what we did inside was we uh, put one of Bert's cameras, and uh, what you see is the, the end of a piece of. Uh, uh, mountain ash that somebody gave me, and it's green. It was about 42% uh, moisture just below that hole. I drill a quarter inch hole and stuff in that little sensor. And uh, Bert says we see some action, but I don't see much action. I've seen some wisping happening. Here. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised just because it's going down. And we're pulled uh, about uh, six or eight inches of mercury vacuum so far. I'd never bothered with a camera in there because I didn't think you'd see anything and it didn't matter to the drying process anyway. Why did I paint it black? Because I painted it black. <laughs> I had some black trim clad and it needed paint. I think when I redo it, I'll paint it white. Uh, this thing, as I said, is 18 inch diameter, 3 8 wall pipe. And uh, it's about 40 inches long because I figured that was as far as I could reach. So Bert was interested in seeing if there was any any um, um, moisture coming out of the wood. So I thought I'd give you a little closer up look of uh, this tank and the fittings because it's hard to see with a wide angle camera. And these are ordinary uh, half inch um, pipe fittings I get from the hardware store. A pipe nipple, as many will know, is just a chunk of uh, pipe threaded at each end and I would cut this in half to go in the top and out the bottom of this thing. These are gas rated ball valves I got from my local hardware store. This is my little vacuum gauge and that's all I need. This is my little uh, ST1000 temperature gauge and that uh, that is uh, routed into the tank. They go along the top of the tank here and then uh, into some holes that I've sealed with uh, seal oil. Underneath is my little vacuum pump. This is a Welsh Duo Seal. It's got a little bitty motor drive in it and then uh, the piston pump itself. Next to it is a tank I made to try to dry out the uh, uh, air coming out of the, the kiln. And it comes from the kiln over to here and then out the top of this and around and into the top of the vacuum. Uh, that thing is filled with a, a bundle of straws just to try to increase the surface area and grab hold of some of the moisture. Next to it is my little uh, exhaust line 
with a closing valve and then a chunk of 4 inch pipe with 8 inch steel top and bottom. I built a simple sight glass, another valve at the bottom where I can drain it. I have a simple uh, shelf on the front to catch the lid. And then over here I have a 110 valve that opens when it's powered. And that just gives me a better seal in the tank when uh, the pump is not running because the pump itself doesn't seal very well. The USB line that I, that I mentioned before comes out. And uh, inside the tank I'll hook it uh, to some alligator clips and these will be attached to some colored nails. I just shrunk some some uh, heat shrink for wiring on there and I'll use them as pairs or I'll have a common ground and then uh, four different sample sites. On the outside I have a matching set. These USB cables have four wires plus a uh, ground so uh, five potential connections. So if one is a common ground, then I got four others I can use. I use a common, commonly found uh, mechanical timer to switch on the pump and uh, the uh, valve in line to the tank. And that I got at Home Depot, it wasn't much. I use these moisture meters, one or the other. Uh, I think I got this one at Busy Bee and this one probably Lee Valley. And these uh, alligator clips, I can use a pair at a time and just clip them onto the, the connectors for there. To seal the pipes, I found that this great white pipe joint compound works the best. The heavy Teflon stuff uh, is okay. The light stuff doesn't work very well. This stuff gets all over everything, but does it ever seal well? So that's, uh, that's about all I can tell you about that. So hopefully that gives you some idea of uh, drying wood in a vacuum kiln. Typically I'll layer the wood in here. Uh, on top of that shelf I'll have a heat mat, then a layer of wood, maybe two, three inches thick, then another heat mat, another layer of wood, and then final, a final heat mat on top of that uh, second layer that uh, fits inside the uh, narrower top of the tank here. I'll come out three or four times a day and check the moisture settings and uh, see how I'm doing. I'll empty the, the little drain tank if need be, make sure there's a decent vacuum. But it really isn't much more complicated than that. When it's all done, I'll slowly let the uh, atmospheric air in and that's over about five minutes or so. And because uh, there's no point in, you know, you're in no hurry after three days really. And, uh, and then pull the wood out. I'll double check the moisture content to make sure that it is what I thought it was and that uh, the nails weren't registering funny. Usually the readings start getting a little odd when it's getting close to the end. I had a uh, paper by a French research scientist that I found. Uh, they, I found a reference to it on the internet from a conference they had in the early 90s, but I couldn't find the paper. so. There was an email for the guy. I emailed him and he was kind enough to send me the paper the next day in English. It was great. And it talked about all the physics and stuff, which didn't really interest me too much, but the economic analysis at the end pointed out that it really wasn't feasible for a commercial operator because they can't put a forklift load of wood into a, a vacuum kiln that's uh, big enough to be economically viable. They want to do entire warehouses full of stuff and that's how our uh, typical two by fours and stuff are done. So that's why it ends up being a victory for the little guy. It doesn't end up costing all that much. To reproduce this today would probably cost me about $500. And half of that is the cost of that uh, Welsh dual seal pump. If you had a smaller setup and got away with one of the smaller uh, $80 uh, diaphragm and oil pumps off of Amazon, uh, you could probably do it for a lot less. Uh, if you already have a vacuum pot and it was a decent size, uh, you could use that. You'd have to figure out how to get uh, power in there and get a drain valve perhaps, but power for sure. 
so that you could wrap a heating pad or something around the wood. I have not found that uh, trying to dry entire logs works that well because you don't get very good heat transfer from these mats to a log. You just have a small area of contact. So typically I'll split them in half and uh, that's often what's done with bowl blanks and things anyway. Uh, I, with a, if I had a vacuum pot, I would probably just get another piece of steel to put on the top instead of the, the usual lid. And then you could play with that piece of steel and not screw anything up. Using a chunk of uh, one foot sewer pipe, um, as I mentioned earlier, is quite doable. I would put a, a chunk of uh, 3 16 plate steel on each end and clamp them with uh, pipe clamps using a inner tube from a, you know, one inch a bicycle or one foot bicycle wheel and that would probably work fine. I would run the uh, fittings through the, the end plate because it's easier to weld them on and seal them and that kind of thing. But uh, it's all quite doable. It's not complicated as you've seen and not everybody has space to do uh, a big pump like that. I did find a uh, Canadian government circular that talked about uh, drying wood with vacuum kilns and it was buried of course in the uh, federal archives, but it was quite interesting and glossy and all that kind of stuff. For me, this is a practical, very, very fast way of drying wood. Uh, the warming box that I mentioned would be just about as good. It just takes four to six months, and I'm too impatient for that. Um, and I think that's about all I can tell you about drying wood in a vacuum kiln. It's easy, it's fast, and uh, not that expensive. So with that, happy turning.